Blog Talk Radio. Rational. Propaganda. Media. Radio. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Now, Red Pill Approved Radio starts. Welcome to Rational Propaganda Radio. This is your host, Jay Tillman. Um, we have an interesting show for you today. Um, today we have a couple of interviews, and, and currently we are waiting on our co-host, Aaron. Um, we're going to interview two Republican candidates that ran for city council um, just recently. Um, they did lose the elections. Um, but we'll get into more of what's going on there. It's quite an interesting story for sure. Um, as far as tonight's show, this is uh, our first show. If you're listening live, uh, we welcome you. Thank you very much. I'm going to make sure that uh, it proves to be interesting and hopefully makes you think outside the box. Maybe put a little critical thinking into the, the equation there. So, the first person that we're going to talk to today... Uh, who should be calling in shortly is uh, Kelly Lawton. Uh, he's a conservative. Uh, when he ran for city council, he ran on being fiscally conservative. Um, currently, with what's going on in, in Tucson, like many cities across America, uh, a lot of city officials have elected to give these big contracts out to um, different construction organizations. Like currently in Tucson, we spent a good deal of money on a streetcar. Uh, I've never had a reason to use that streetcar simply because basically goes out to the university and goes to 4th Avenue in downtown area. 4th Avenue is a um, quite a popular little site. So, uh, Aaron, are you with us? I am here. Hey, welcome, Mr. Co-host. <laughs> Anon Aaron. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. How, I had a little bit of trouble connecting there for a second. Okay, yeah. I was uh, telling everyone how this is uh, our first official broadcast. Uh, yes, sir. Yay. <laughs> Yay. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited, too. Um, I'm, uh, I did t talk to both of the uh, Tucson City Council members um, briefly and made sure that... Uh, we had the time for them to call, so we're um, we're basically going to be waiting on a call here in the next ten minutes from uh, a gentleman named Kelly Lawton. Okay. He actually ran and and promoted uh, fiscal responsibility. That's an important aspect of politics today. Fiscal responsibility. I I I really agree with you. Um, it seems <clears throat> what. I don't know if you caught the uh, tail end of that, but it seems like across our whole country, um, cities are putting gobs of money into these projects that uh, aren't really helping the majority of people in their cities. I would agree with that. Um, one of the biggest, one of the biggest things, you know, our, our worst case scenario as far as uh, as 
economic stability, of course, are is Detroit. What's happening over in Detroit? And oh, yes. uh, have have you heard about uh, you know what they actually spent money on in Detroit, the city? Spent money I'm not really them. sure, but I know that uh, a lot of their money goes out in pensions and stuff every year. So, I mean. The thing is, I don't know the exact breakdown of the figures or anything, no. Well, you know, I, I could look up the exact breakdown of the figures, but um, basically they uh, they uh, put in a monorail. Okay. And then they built a, a gigantic hockey stadium. <laughs> Right. Now it does it doesn't take anyone with any brains whatsoever to you know need to go up and look up the exact figures um, to know that that's a lot of freaking money. Yes, that seems like a lot of money to uh, burn when you cannot pay your own bills. So I would agree with you on that. Exactly, um, and yeah, and and I, I guess that's the. Uh, that that's the the fine point of it all is is that here the the city council is elected to spend a whole bunch of money when a whole bunch of people are are suffering in their um, daily lives, right? And moving out of this city, and you know I of course I would I would much prefer the first-hand experience and to actually go and spend some time in Detroit before um, I try to pretend that I know everything about it. But from what I what I research, from what I can understand, basically, um, a lot of people have moved out of Detroit. And they have this new studio, uh, stadium and they have a new monorail and the population is you know cut down to like a quarter I don't know I'd have to look that up actually Detroit population well, unfortunately it seems it, like it seems like a lot of the money has moved out of Detroit I mean they're they're you know hemorrhaging industry and stuff like that. So it's kind of it's kind of bad because they're they're putting up, you know, huge buildings and they don't have much their tax base is decreasing but their spending is increasing. So it's kind of backwards. It really is. Hey, would um here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna we got a caller here, so let me let me check on see who that is. Okay. Hello, is this Kelly? Hello? Hello, is this Kelly? Yeah, Jason, Kelly, yeah. Hi, Kelly, this is uh, Jason, and uh, Aaron is my co-host here today. Oh, great. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Yay, thanks for thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us. I was uh telling Aaron here that uh you had just recently run for Tucson City Council and uh you ran on a platform that uh isn't often heard in politics and that is uh fiscal responsibility. Yeah, that's uh that was one of of uh of a couple pretty uh key uh topics. Uh fiscal responsibility was at the top of my list. Um it has everything to do with uh the city of Tucson, uh, uh you know, year over year, uh fiscally uh spending money uh that they don't have and um you know, as a matter of fact, uh, looking forward, uh, they're looking at about a forty million dollar uh budget uh, shortfall. And, uh, you know, they just continue with this tax, borrow, and spend mentality, which is uh, which is really killing the future of the city. Yeah, and uh, we were we were speculating um, that this was something that was maybe going on uh, 
on a more of a national level, um, and we were using Detroit as the example, uh, I looked up the statistics and I found out since uh, 95 Detroit, in 1995, Detroit had um, just over a million people. Yeah. Um, well, first on uh, demographically speaking, uh, we're well. Let's let's talk geographic. We're a city of about 236 square miles. Our population uh, floats about uh, 200. Or our population floats at about 535,000 people in the metro area. However, the if we include the county. Uh, Pima County uh, and the city of Tucson, we're looking at pretty close at about a million, uh, million one as far as uh, county and city population together. Yeah, well, currently the uh, the growth uh, in that population uh, has has went up uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, it's kind of in line with Albuquerque and uh, El Paso because in '95 we had. About four hundred and fifty thousand, and currently, like you said, it's uh, right up there at five thirty-five. On the contrast, though, uh, you know, worst case scenario in the country, Detroit in '95 had just over a million, and then there was a drop in 2013 from uh, nine hundred and ten thousand down to seven. Hundred thousand uh, within that year. Yeah. Well, I, I, I admit, oh, go ahead. Oh, and and currently it's just at uh, six eighty eight, and we were we were using that as an example because they, the city council there, even though people are leaving and a lot of a lot of regular folks are suffering because of uh, them not taking care of the finances, uh, they've invested money in a monorail. And a hockey stadium, and uh, instead of being the auto industry leader and the most the richest city in the world, um, it's now been a uh, industry of gambling. Yeah, the uh, well, you know, Detroit Metro, uh, as you mentioned, was really the iconic city uh, of the future because of industry, uh, robust economy, uh, you know, just. Uh, a great city to live in. Um, however, um, as time progressed, um, the, the Detroit Metro, um, they went bankrupt. And uh, if, uh, if, if the city of Tucson does not get its arms around uh, their budget, uh, if they don't get their arms around uh, the spending, there's no real, there's no real viable revenue source uh, in the city of Tucson, so they've really got to uh, to get their arms around job creation uh, because uh, when you look at the economics of of uh, of the actual um, economic development, the city of Tucson grew less than one percent. I believe it was even in a negative number. So, you know, we're looking at a future, uh, a very grim future, uh, economically speaking, when we when we talk about. Uh, the financial position of the city. So um, there's there's a lot that we can do if we don't if we don't make corrective action. We don't try to you know look at our job creators, open the doors of opportunity for innovation, and get rid of the bureaucratic red tape. You know to to um, actually influence job creation. Then we're we're going to be on the same track as Detroit, and uh, we'll be we'll be in a bankrupt situation. Well, I, I I tend to agree with uh, everything you said, and and I think you know Detroit's the worst case scenario. But we kind of speculated that this was a happening throughout all major cities in the country. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, on a national level, you, know, you had a recession, you know, that has had a significant impact to you know the the entire the country. So. Each country is uh, is really recovering at, at various rates. I mean, you look at Houston, for example. Houston has a robust economy. Uh, you know, they're they're growing by leaps and bounds. There's uh, great job growth. They have awesome uh, leadership. You know, that's that's really pushing the the city itself into uh, you know 
into great growth. And, um, you know, then you look at Tucson. And um, I think the economic difference is that our economy is not that diverse. Um, we have an economy in Tucson that seems to be very uh, centered around construction. Uh, and uh, with construction, you know, the recession, it was, uh, it was a pretty significant hit. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the multi multiplier structure. Infrastructure oh, yeah. construction, is that what you're referring to, or other construction outside of that? Well, infrastructure, residential, commercial, I mean, we've got, we've got a lot of vacant buildings in Tucson. And, um, you know, the, uh, I think, you know, then again, to go back to the root cause, you know, you're looking at a recession uh, that some say, oh, we're, you know, we're recovering, you know, faster than anybody you know else in the in the state but then uh you compare our growth rate to phoenix or you compare our growth rate to to tempe or um our just our neighbors to the north or old valley or morana uh we're pretty stagnant here okay well aaron where aaron is he's uh he's on the other side of the country he's uh in the panhandle of florida uh where oh, the navy that. base Okay. Yes, we, we had a we had a lot of downturn in construction over here. Uh -huh. He's in Pensacola, Florida, um, yeah. and I think the same thing's happening because in '95 they were almost at sixty thousand, uh, and they're down to fifty-two, uh, yeah. fifty-three thousand. But um, so yeah, well, one, one of the, the things the policies are different. The I'm policies sorry? are a little different. Mm -hmm. The policies tend to be a little different over here because of the the political landscape in Florida. The panhandle the panhandle tends to go a little more red and the um of course the, the, the peninsula tends to go a little bit more blue. So but in the panhandle um we've I wouldn't say we've recovered but we started to recover already. It it was pretty bad though. Construction construction fell through the floor. Because that, that was the main thing for Pensacola was tourism. So mm -hmm. hopefully and the tourism he has to is, deal uh, with the hurricanes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, the hurricanes uh, and alligators and all that good stuff. And, uh, yeah, and, and I would, you know, Kelly, in all honesty, I, I would almost suspect the economic situation there is... Uh, you know, compared to Tucson, probably a little worse. But you were running on fiscal responsibility, and I can only imagine is that a is that a hard job to convince Democrats and Republicans to be a little more uh, on the side of savings instead of spending to boost the economy. Well, you know, uh, I think it's interesting because uh, when you look at economic development and you look at, uh, you know, trying to stimulate and, or jumpstart an economy, um, again, uh, I'm a firm believer that, that that is going to happen with job creation uh, because we don't need more taxes. We need more taxpayers. So... As you increase your economic base with jobs, you know, the more people that are employed, thus increases your economic base, your taxpayer base. So, you know, we, we, you know, we live in a very beautiful place. And we're surrounded by mountains. Um, it, it truly has, you know, great beauty, uh, just beyond words. If you haven't been to Tucson, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really, it's a beautiful place. If you haven't been here, please come. But, um, you know, we, we do, um, I think what's, what's key here is we have, we have some neighbors to the south, uh, in Mexico, we have a deep sea port, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh in Hermosillo. Um, there's, you know, you've got a great logistics hub right here in Tucson, the International Airport. Uh, we have a viable rail system, uh, an inter, you know, uh, an interstate highway, not only that goes east to west, but north to south. Uh, so we have great opportunities for growth and economic development. However, we just do not have the leadership in place 
to make that happen. We don't have leaders in place that understand, uh, you know, the matrix or, you know, the, the simple math of job creation is going to get our economy going, not raising taxes. And maybe uh, allow people to, to be entrepreneurs, uh, make it easy for people to start their own business, I, I could imagine. You know, you just nailed it on the head right there. We have, we have the fifth best entrepreneurial university in the country uh, at the Eller School of Management. The fifth best entrepreneurial school in the country. I didn't know Do that. We what, have, what? Yeah, it's the Eller School of Business at the University of Arizona. And, um, you know, that right there, we, we don't have any job clusters. We don't have any sectors. Uh, that are byproducts. We are the greatest exporter of college-educated graduates in the country, I think. If there's one thing that we do well in Tucson, Arizona, that's export college graduates to other places because there's no jobs here. Wow. You know, yeah, that, I, sounds, that actually ahead. sounds a lot like Pensacola yeah. because we don't really have much industry here other than tourism. So basically, all our college graduates just go right out the door to a bigger city down the yeah. road. So yeah, it's, it's sad because you know there again, you know, uh, I always I always use the uh, you know the analogy uh, Stanford University, a byproduct of Stanford University, a viable economic driver for Stanford University was Silicon Valley. They created Silicon Valley. So all the billions of dollars of software and, uh, and uh, tech jobs, all of that is a byproduct of Stanford University. The University of Arizona could be very, very, very close to that if they had leadership in place to put you know, the Eller School and entrepreneurial uh, uh, job clusters in play. We could be very successful. Wow. Well, I, I I think that's probably good advice uh, for the whole nation, uh, Kelly. I I know you lost the election um, this most recently uh, election, most recent election, um, but I definitely would encourage you, even if you're not making money, if you could, uh, you know, step up and continue to to take that leadership role and maybe. Um, Go down there to the city council and uh, get involved. Maybe put some of that uh, logical um, influence on these people. I, I know it's it's difficult to kind of get through to people, but uh, my whole point is uh, I want to encourage you to stay involved. It sounds like you have a really positive uh, outlook on, on what we need to do to help the majority of people here in Tucson, and yeah, really? I, I couldn't imagine going into financial trouble and needing to make money to, to, to keep the roof over my head or feed my family, um, and I can't walk out the door and, and make an honest buck um, mm. for whatever reason, I, and, and I'm sure it leaves a lot of people to go to the black market and make a, a dishonest buck that way. So I, I really, uh, I want to stay positive on these, uh, stay an optimist on, on what we can do and, and uh, hopefully for a better future for Tucson, it can be a role model for everybody else uh, like San Bernardino and these other places that are uh, just bankrupting themselves and well, but, I'll tell you what, we, we've got an electoral process here that was deemed unconstitutional. So uh, myself and Margaret Burkle are currently uh, litigating. We filed uh, papers on Friday. Um, we want to ensure that uh, our constitutional right and uh, the rights of our, our constituents in, in our wards uh, have fair and equitable representation. And... Uh, so we we've got a little bit of a battle uh, in that arena, and uh, you know our hopes is, and I think we we do have uh, you know we do have uh, some the Constitution in our favor, 
so, you know, looking forward, hopefully myself and Margaret Burkholder will be on that city council and we'll be able to lead this city in a new direction, a prosperous uh, prosperous direction. Who, who deemed the, um, our election process, I guess the election process we've been using since 1929, who deemed it unconstitutional? Well, here's here's the interesting piece. Uh, we we started our campaigns. Uh, just to give you a little brief history here, we started campaigns back in April, and uh, you know the 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 current um, the current elections uh, process and procedure is that you have uh, you know you, there's a the uh, the uh, uh, general election is citywide. Uh, the but you have your first phase of that you're going to uh you're going to run in your ward you have to gather enough signatures in your ward um your ward two is that correct ward ward two yep and uh we actually run ward only uh and we run a primary um i won the primary uh for my party as did uh, mr cunningham for his and then we moved from a primary election to a general election. Now, mind you, the primary election was ward only. So it's and then we people moved, you represent in the party in the area of the city that you're responsible for. That's correct. Okay. So just wanted to make one, sure I understood. Yes. So once we, once we uh, progress past the primary, now we have two defined candidates, two partisan candidates, uh, uh, candidates, uh, one for uh, the Dems and one for the Republicans, and uh, and so then we head off into the general election, uh, which we run a citywide campaign. Now, mind you, when we started this campaign, uh, we had no idea that there was a a federal lawsuit that was filed. I'm sorry, uh, there was a lawsuit that was filed in Pima County Superior Court on behalf of some previous uh, council folks uh, from previous election years that were deeming uh, the election process as as uh, unconstitutional, uh, saying that you can't run a general and a primary, primary ward only. And so now this was simultaneous. So what happened was once um, we kicked off our campaign, uh, this lawsuit was already in play. Um, they, the courts kicked it back. The attorneys appealed, went to the federal level, and the Ninth Circuit Court, the most liberal court in the nation, came back with a two-to-one split, a two-to-one split that our constitution, our city constitution for electoral process is unconstitutional. Even it though it's not, in the Republicans' favor, it's actually in the Democrats' favor because current. the Democrat, yeah, the current, the uh, the citywide election is the majority, uh, Democrat majority. So if you have, for example, myself running on the far east side of town, Ward Two, uh, it is predominantly a Republican ward. However, in the general election, the whole city votes for the representation in Ward 2. Not just the constituents, but the whole city. Right. So if you, have a city, if you have a city with a majority of Democratic votes or voters, uh, therefore it's not a one-man, one-vote scenario as outlined in the 14th Amendment. So... So the election goes forward. The the incumbents win because they have the Democratic majority. However, myself and Margaret Burkholder won the wards. So we actually wore, uh, won the precinct. So um, yeah, Tucson News Now reported that uh, uh, you had lost to Paul Cunningham, uh, but would have won um, by. 11,137 votes to 10,179 if the votes for Ward 2 would have been counted. 
Yeah, yeah, it uh, would have been a little over a thousand folks that uh, would have pushed me into the seat. Uh, and I think Mar yeah, Margaret, I think she was close to like 3,000 uh, for her ward. So, you know, once, once uh, you know, we, we waited for the, uh, the precincts and the early ballot to count. And the day that they certified the election, also the court came out with their ruling that our electoral process was unconstitutional. So we immediately, uh, you know, got to the table and wanted to see what our legal position was. And we, we do have a, a legal position, and that being that our constituents in the ward, um, you know, that you uh, represent. Are, yeah, that I yeah that I represent. That wanted, you would be representing. Well, yep, that I that I would be representing wanted Kelly Lawton as their representative at the table at Tucson City Council. So, you know, we're we're going to fight the battle. Um, okay, it you sounds know, like we, you have legal grounds, but it also sounds like you have moral grounds that it would be hard pressed for anyone to try to twist it and say, Oh, they're just being evil Republicans <laughs> yeah. because yeah. obviously uh, the, just the simple facts of the, the information here would, uh, would say, Hey, wait a minute. Some, something's not right here. You're supposed oh, sure. to be a representative of the people. And I, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, what's funny, too, is that, uh, you know, I've already faced the commentary. Uh, everything from, you know, Margaret and myself are sour grapes, uh, that we're, you know, we're um, sore losers. Oh, uh, I, I mean, knew you were going to say that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sore losers. Uh, you know, but the sad, the sad thing here is those folks are so short-sighted, they do not realize what's at stake. And it, what's at stake here is fair and equitable representation and constitutionality of our election system in Tucson. That's what's at stake. Well, I, I, I would definitely, I would definitely sum up this situation as uh, um, if they're calling you sore losers and and this and that, um, yeah. I would categorize that as non rational propaganda it's just it doesn't sound like it's true unless i'm not getting the other side of the story yeah well they they there was uh you know there was a council person that's actually uh, i can i can direct you if you go to tucson citizen uh uh paul cunningham's already made a statement that uh you know i'm crazy you know for wanting to push this legally uh he says that the judge that made made the statement uh, is from South Dakota, and uh, you know what does he know? And uh, and uh, Steve Kozacek was the one that made the statement that you know we're a bunch of you know we're sour grapes, and uh, you know he states that you know he ran as a Republican, he lost in his ward, but he won citywide, and. Uh, you know, he, he's saying that, you know, we're afraid to talk about it. I'm not afraid to talk about it. He did not. These these folks are not facing the this unconstitutional decision by the Ninth Circuit Court. And if, they took an they, oath to the Constitution, correct? Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and the yeah. little sidebar, I, I know Aaron's not really too familiar with... Um, Local politics, but this Steve Kowachek, uh is he Ward Four? I believe. No, he, he, uh, he's Ward Six. He's a Ward Six guy. He comes ward up for six, election. That's right. Yeah, he comes up for election, and I think another two years. He actually ran through the Republican Party, um, and then when he won, when he won, he, he switched teams. He went over to the Democratic Party, and now he's a. Democrat. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and, he did. And, he did. You know that the unmoral part about it is when when you run in a party like that, people are donating to you. They're promoting you. They're they're going out to events. They're working really hard for you. And uh, yep. 
it's uh, you take their money, you take all their hard work, you take all their faith and love and and promotion, yep. and then you say, "Excuse yep. me, you know, screw you, I'm I'm out of here. I, these guys are nicer, or whatever whatever his reasonings are." Wow. Yeah. Yeah, um, just in, uh, you know, not to mention the trust that you say you lost. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's that's I, I, if he's if he's calling you as you know whatever. Uh, quite frankly, his actions speak for himself, and and uh, I would you know that would be a definition of two face in my yeah. um, you know a uh, guy who doesn't know anything book you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, well, it I... seems, go ahead. It, it seems too that an issue that they forget is that um, political cycles, you know, certain uh, political cycles come and go, and you know people get into office, and then you know one party wins, then later on they lose, and for some reason they don't seem to remember that things tend to go in cycles. So what yeah. they do now actually affects the future in the long term. Sure. So yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. Yeah, so it's it's going to be an interesting road. Um, like I said, we filed on Friday, uh, and I know you're going to have Margaret on uh, shortly. So uh, what, she'll elaborate uh, what, more. What do you guys got going on tomorrow? Or I heard uh, from uh, the Republican chairman Bill Beard that uh, something was going on at the city council tomorrow. Well, there is a, a scheduled council meeting. Uh, it's nothing uh, has nothing to do with myself or Margaret. Um, it's my understanding that they're going to confirm the new police chief. Um, it's also my understanding is they're going to discuss. They will discuss uh, the legal position and um, you know what's the current uh, status of what's going on uh, with. Uh, Certifying the the election, we actually asked uh, for them to to uh, put a stop to the certification. Um, so we're going to see we're going to see how they uh, how they respond tomorrow. Okay. Well, I wonder if any uh, uh, constitutional uh, Republicans or even constitutional Democrats are going to come out there and. Uh, Show show some support um, and uh, holding our leaders accountable to uh, the oaths they take. Yeah, no, you know, and you know, it's it's. I'm glad you said that because uh, I had a, a gentleman come up uh, yesterday. We were chatting about it, and uh, he's a Democrat. He made himself, you know, he put it put himself right in my way, and you know, he said, "What exactly is your?" You know what what's going on? I'm you know not really clear on what's going on. And I said, I said what's at stake here is you know your your representation. And uh, I said every every citizen in Tucson, regardless of party, should be concerned with the ruling from the Ninth Circuit Court about our election system being unconstitutional, one man, one vote, violation of the 14th Amendment. Every citizen should be concerned, and every citizen should be down at that city council meeting tomorrow demanding upholding of our constitutional rights in the 14th Amendment. Yeah, well, it would be nice to have a more a moral majority uh, yeah. that was interested in addressing the... Uh, Issues that we're all facing instead of playing games such as party politics and I'm right, you're wrong, you're evil, yeah. I'm good, you know, whatever the game may be. Um, right. and, and I want to tell you, Kelly, uh, I thank you for the interview. I'll, I'll make sure that I share that um, this broadcast uh, with uh, some people and, and hopefully uh, we can get uh, more people aware of what's going on so they can... Uh, Use a little common sense and critical thinking and uh, just viewing the facts to come to their own conclusions on what's yeah. right and wrong uh, without having to be blinded by um, high school games, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I totally Kelly, agree. Th thank you very much for coming on here. And uh, again, I, I want to encourage you uh, to continue. Aaron, do you have any uh, questions, last questions? 
uh, minute questions for Kelly? Well, I wish I could be there at the, count, at the meeting tomorrow, but unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to make it today. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if well, I could, I would. If I could, well, I, I would. Appreciate that. Well, um, you definitely I appreciate have my you showing up too. You definitely have our support, Kelly, and um, you know, continue sure. to, to make a positive impact in this world. Uh, and you have my uh, respect for that. Uh, any last, any last words, or anything else you want to say before I let you go? I uh, thank you for the time. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, if there's any any time you know it comes up, you want to chat, feel free to reach out. I'll be glad to come on and. You know, God bless America. God bless our great city of Tucson, Arizona. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, thank you very much, Amen. sir. And um, you have a wonderful night. Good luck uh, with the fight. All right. Thank I appreciate you. it. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow, Aaron. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's um quite a uh quite a web we can weave in politics definitely yeah i didn't i didn't know um it was that you know it was that insane at the even at the local level oh absolutely and and it it kind of uh boggles my mind at times um people don't get involved at a local level. Well, yeah, it seems like everybody's worried about the uh, the national level as opposed to the local level, but the local level is really where, you know, our democracy starts, so or where it's the, very important. Uh, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Yes, sir. That's where the, you know, that, that's where everything starts is at the uh, local level. It may feel the good. The national level is where it ends, but the local mm -hmm. level is where it begins. Well, and and that's kind of the um, the ideology of uh, how uh, our country was uh, built. Feels pretty good, though, you know, voting in the national level, and you can you can go. I voted, and I feel good today. Um, but it's a shame if you if if you ignore your local government. And what you actually have some power to control. Um, yeah, because Jay could have been one of those twenty thousand voters that voted in that election. Well, I, I think you know, with voter turnout being so low, uh, people aren't happy. I, I don't know that uh, it really does make a difference, but. Um, it's just a, it a lot harder to influence the federal government or a centralized government that you don't have contact with. If you influence your yeah. local local government and hold them accountable, but it's not just holding them accountable. I always hear, "Oh, our politicians need to do this. Our politicians need to do that." From people who don't do anything themselves. Right. I agree with you on that. Well, it's I I hold um, myself uh, or the individual uh, just as responsible for how we are governed as the people who are getting paid to do it. Yeah, well, the people are supposed to make the choice on that. So, well, unfortunately, when the people make bad choices, you get uh, bad consequences coming out of it. Yeah. So and. Uh, it's kind of a shame. Well, I want to take a one and a half minute break and play everyone's favorite song. <laughs> Is it the top because, song? Yeah, yeah, because we can vote. Oh, we can know. vote. We can pay taxes. And it's all on our politicians. You know, I've done my part. They got to take care of this mess. I got too much stuff to do. <laughs> That's the way it goes sometimes, right? Yes, sir. It's kind of a shame. Um, but what can you do? You know? Play a song. We 
We must pay for this war this somehow. War Uncle Sam was worried, but he isn't now. Isn't now. Oh, I paid my, my income, income tax today. today. Everybody's favorite song, yes. It's not my favorite song. <laughs> I um maybe next show I I have the uh, Walt Disney production of uh, Spirit of what is it 43 featuring okay. Donald Donald Duck. <laughs> it's one of the war movies that Disney released. Yeah, it's uh, it is uh, it, basically what it is. It's it's promoting all Americans to do their part uh, and uh, contribute to the uh, World War II uh, war effort. And since prior to World War II, there was uh, no tax on the lower-income Americans. I remember that. Yeah, and you know, I we had a wonderful time. I don't know. I wasn't. I wasn't born. <laughs> I wasn't even a thought of. I wasn't even a gleam in my father's eye, as they say. <laughs> you know. Now I'd heard that saying ever since I was a kid. Never understood it until, well, uh, after puberty. You know, <laughs> a gleam in my father's eye. Hey. Yeah. Quite a it's very thing. interesting thing. But we we hear a lot about income inequality. Income inequality. We hear about the disparaging, you know, income gap. But we don't hear about the people who are suffering the most, giving them financial relief. You know, working for minimum wage. Uh, we don't hear about lifting their taxes. We just hear about we have income in inequality. Let's get some uh, more taxpayer, more tax money. Well, we have our guest on. I'm going to bring her right on, Aaron. Yes, sir. Hello, Margaret. Oh, she dropped, so she must have had maybe the same problem uh, that you did. So. Hopefully she'll come right on back. But why don't we hear that? Why don't we hear um, some common sense um, tax reform to help the poor? Well, it's because, you know, that's that's not the direction that they want to take it. They want to take it in the direction of, oh, hey, more taxes. It's better for America when we pay more tax. I don't know why. Well, I think it's need more money. It's not like they don't have enough money already. Yeah, I think they should cut spending um, and uh, maybe tax a little bit more, but to the right people. Uh, okay, well, Margaret's back. Let's see if we can get her on this time. Okay. Hello, Margaret. Hello. Hi, this is uh, Jason Tillman uh, and uh, my co-host, Aaron. How are you tonight? I'm doing great, thanks. We uh, we had a great conversation with uh, Kelly about what was going on, uh, and we talked a lot about fiscal responsibility um, and how he was running on that. Um, you recently ran for city council. Um, one of your primary things you were, were campaigning on was uh, something quite important to most people in Tucson and that's fixing our roads. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And, you know, if you're going to, I just caught a little bit because I'm actually at um, a legislative advocacy a meeting of school board members from around Pima County. So I wasn't able to catch your show, but if I could piggyback on some of what I've heard, you, you know, you're talking about income inequality. Roads are simply a symptom of the of the issues that we have in Tucson. So everybody sees the roads. We drive on the roads. Is there enough money to fix the roads? There absolutely is. But it's not being spent on the roads. More so to the problem is why are we seeing this symptom 
of crumbling roads, crumbling infrastructure, is because we have a low median income. So if you talk about some of the things that I want to do as a member of city council, it's to raise that minimum income. And there's talk right now floating around about um, increasing minimum wage, and that artificially raises income for some while devastating others. And so that's not the way to go. But if you're going to talk about how do you fix roads, we've got to have more taxpayers, not more taxes, more taxpayers, making more money, having more money that they can spend um, in that expendable income and address it that way. Yeah, and and we uh, we touched on that briefly with uh, Kelly um, on that as far as um, also creating an environment that uh, incorporates entrepreneurship that actually creates jobs, uh, making it a, a job creation friendly city. Yes, yeah, absolutely. To put, pe- put people back to work. And quite frankly, you know, we do have some some good roads here, um, but uh, there are other roads. I saw a pothole the other day that uh, scared me. I thought it could fit a a, a, a good sized cat, you know. Yeah. Thought, yeah. <laughs> and if you hit, I mean, if you hit your tire in one of those potholes, you could do lots and lots of damage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and and of course that doesn't help and, and my income inequality either because now I got no, get a no alignment. No, <laughs> yeah, and the other thing that I would mention is I I was endorsed by the Arizona Daily Star, and during our interview where we met with the editorial board, they asked some questions like it is not the government's job to create jobs. That's not what city council should do. City council to give the atmosphere and the ability for job creators to create jobs. And so um, the woman I was running against, the incumbent, was saying, here's what city has done. Their incentives weren't working, A, because we see we still have the problem, but they were incentives for such a small fraction of business owners, you had to be willing to pay 75% of health care costs. You had to be willing to do this, 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 none of which the city was willing to do, by the way, for their employees. But you would expect if you wanted these tax incentives that you would be expected to cover those which the city can't or wasn't willing to cover. And so the other thing is they... you'd have to be willing to give back. Okay. Yeah, I'm and sorry, so go they ahead. weren't incentivizing. They weren't incentivizing. And that was the whole point of these incentives was to create business. The other thing they said is you had to have a minimum of so many, but you couldn't have more than 30 or 35 business, I mean, um, employees. And so, again, we need to have a broad base of businesses. We need small, medium, and large employers here in our community to have a strong, well-balanced workforce. And we just don't. Tucson is known as this minimum wage town. And one of the things that I ran on was was raising median income. And the only way that's going to happen is in the private sector. Because if you look at our top ten employers, seven of them are government. And if all we're doing is taxing ourselves to pay ourselves, we're not going to grow. I, you know, I, I have to agree with you, Margaret, uh, pretty much 100%. Um, and it is lifting regulation that, that ultimately comes off more of a punishment than a benefit in the name of making it easier for businesses to grow um, would, be, would be the way to do that uh, as far as... And like you said, you, if we're the 10 top employer... Uh, I know one of our number one employers is Walmart, which uh, just sells products. Jay? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I've yeah. always heard. You know? I've always heard that the best way to incentivize business is for the government to just get out of the way. 
That's what I said so many times. They said, how are you going to fix things? I said, I'm going to get out of the way. Let business, business will take care of itself. You want to raise median, um, you want to raise the minimum wage? Let me tell you how to do it. All you have to do is if you want the best employees and everybody can, if you want best employees and everybody has a job that pays well, if you want that best employee, you have to pay more to attract them. This has to be settled through supply and demand, not by artificially raising minimum wage. Well, and and, and, and quite often I know you have to remind people sometimes that they, they act as if government has a money tree. And sometimes you have to kind of bring them back down to earth and, and reality. Government, city government, federal government, they make no money. They can either tax or they can borrow. And currently, uh, we had quite a discussion uh, with uh, Kelly about, uh, you know, how this city and, and cities across our whole country is uh, uh, borrowing themselves into possible bankruptcy. Yeah. So I Absolutely. definitely... And I would say Tucson is more towards probable bankruptcy than possible bankruptcy. Yeah, there's quite a... I, I do, because there's a, a lot of cities uh, in our nation that uh, it's more probable. Um, my co-host, Aaron, here, um, that I'm dominating the conversation from, uh, he's from Pensacola, Florida, and uh, I suspect his economical situation there in Pensacola is... Uh, uh, quite a bit more bleak, but he also is on the panhandle, so they deal with hurricanes. And their main industry is tourism. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's unfortunate because, you know, we have a, an excellent deep water port here, but it only can uh, hold one ship at a time because they don't want to build industry here. So what can we do? Yeah, they and have- just like with... Just like with any, whether you're looking at an investment portfolio or a retirement portfolio, you want to have balance. And when any region is tied to just one industry, then they suffer highs and lows outside of their control. When you have a balanced portfolio of jobs, I mean, in southern Arizona, we have um, tourism, especially in the winter, is a big part of of our economic drivers. And when you have a recession, it just means if it's one of your top money makers for your community, then when when the nation goes through recessions, your communities hit harder than other nations where there are other industries to balance. We, yeah, we got that. we got crushed. We got crushed by both the recession and the oil spill out in the Gulf. So we had to come back to back. Yeah. And and we see that that what what you're explaining about, if you have an area of one industry, we see that playing out uh, even on a global scale, such as Venezuela. They have the biggest oil reserves in the world, but their people are starving because they have no other industry, and that industry is run exclusively by the government. Mm-hmm. So it, and, and from our perspective of get government out of the way, that's one of the worst-case scenarios, that the fact that it's run by government doesn't help the situation. And isn't it just another example of socialism that doesn't work? So if you're sitting on a... Let's just call those oil fields, you know, leprechauns, pots of gold. You would think that they could just distribute it to everybody in their country. But economic or, systems don't work that way. Yeah, I... I Human I, beings I, I, don't work that way. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I grew up, I watched the Beverly Hillbillies. He struck oil. He was in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Yeah, it's supposed yeah. to, it, it, you're supposed to make a, a ton of money off of it. Right now, oil is uh, is down, but ultimately, the majority of people uh, they're due to the socialism and and 
having that only industry, um, they're starving. And that, that uh, I, I, you know, I think everyone, whether you're Republican or Democrat, says to themselves instinctually, it doesn't have to be that way. It, you know, there should be some mm-hmm. solution. But yeah, we end up arguing yeah, about other things. <laughs> Yeah, and so, you know, I one of the platforms I've run on, and I'm sure when you talked with Kelly, you talked about our lawsuit um, with the city and the constitutionality of our race, but I am still out there fighting every day, saying we need someone who's reasonable and can look at reason. And, you know, I don't think we need politicians that are at the far extremes of any party. We need people who can look at the facts and say, we understand that this this is common sense, this is what will work in our community, and that's what we need to do. Well, he brought that up. He said that um, it was deemed unconstitutional by a court that was made up of uh, Democrats. What was it, the 6th District Court? Ninth, Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit. Out of San Francisco. Okay. Uh, They deemed it unconstitutional, even though... It would have been in your favor to done it in a more constitutional way. Um, we see here that you lost to Shirley Scott, um, but would have won uh, by 9,143 votes to her 6,533 if yes. only votes in Ward 4, the, the district that you are supposed the people that you're supposed to represent uh, would have uh, been counted. That's quite absolutely. A, and and shouldn't government job. be representative of the people? Imagine if you know. And it's one of the reasons we have an electoral college. We have an electoral college because we don't want the top um, three to five populated states kicking our president. We need every. We need all states have a representative voice. And that's what we're fighting for in the cities, that that there are minority voices and they should still have a have a place at the table. Well, I appreciate you representing a lot of my thoughts and ideas. And even if you didn't win um this this round I I encourage you to be a, a positive influence on the um city council as best as you can and get some of those ideas. Um, you know, uh, and and as far as the lawsuit, you know, Kelly and I and Aaron, we kind of touched on the uh, party politic games and name calling, um, you know, basically calling you sore losers. Um, mm. And by not abiding you know, constitutional law that benefits the majority of people are the people that you're representing. And I, it just boggles my mind that they can call you guys name, but uh, they're not, they're not representing, you know, they're not yeah. representing the people that voted them in. I served for three terms on the Vail School District Governing Board, and each time I was sworn in, you raise your hand that you, that you swear an oath to protect this country and defend the Constitution. And that's exactly what I'm doing. When the courts say that this is unconstitutional, I took an oath that I would protect and defend. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And so I appreciate and this is one of the one of the things that we fight for is this idea of free speech. So I, I mean people can say whatever they want to say I'm to, I'll, I mean, I'll say it again. Don't judge me on my words. Judge me on my actions. Look at what I do. And so that's why I'm still fighting to, um, to represent the, the citizens in my ward in southeast Tucson. So thank you so much for having me on. I very much appreciate Margaret, the invitation. thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your time and your information. Um, and... Uh, Please uh, continue, continue to make a positive influence and and putting our Constitution and our American values above party politics and other games. You have a wonderful day. Absolutely. Karen, do you have anything quick? Okay, have a good night, Margaret. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.
Well, Aaron, that that uh, definitely proves um, proves to be two wonderful uh, interviews. I'm glad we got information. Yes, uh, two very uh, informative and interesting people. I um, I'm kind of sad they don't live in Tucson. <laughs> well, you, guys got you some know, good people it, over there. Oh, we, you know, I I I will have to say. With my, uh, you know, I lived in Pensacola for a year. Um, before that, I lived outside of Chicago. Uh, I had to grow up with Illinois politics, which. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. I I am sorry too. It. Uh, I uh, have been down here since '97, and the. Population growth in Tucson since 1997 to today, 2015, uh, has increased the total amount over the total amount of the city I grew up in in Illinois. <laughs> That's pretty in appreciable that, growth. Yeah, in that time frame, in that time frame, and. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I grew up thinking, the best way to deal with um, gun violence is restricting guns. Um, that that was really what I believed in, um, and kind of what I was taught. I I was in fear of guns, but moving down to Tucson, um, I see we have the most liberal gun policies in the country where Illinois has the most restrictive gun policies and uh, the violence is about double violent crime and property damage uh, up in Illinois and so how you govern locally or on a state level and uh, all of that uh, can really impact people financially even uh, when it comes to crime and violence and everything else. Uh, and it's kind of a shame because going back every couple of years to go visit family, it kind of looks like where I grew up, my youth stomping grounds um, is going the way of Detroit. It's, it's declining and, and things are getting worse and a lot more people are suffering. Yeah, it looks like it. Chicago doesn't look very good, that's for sure. No, no. And um, and I think people are trying very hard to address these problems. Just like we have some good people here in Arizona um, fighting for the majority to uh, try to help them out, uh, it's an uphill battle, and it's a thankless job. So I, I really have to have a lot of respect for people who who do it and try to do it honestly. I agree. Um, you know, and as as far as that, uh, politics, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a crazy game. It, it can be a very crazy game, especially when you get a lot of misinformation or to coin our radio show, uh, non-rational, uh, propaganda trying to compete with rational propaganda. Emotional versus, yes, thinking propaganda. Being blinded by emotional uh, emotions. Um, well, you know, anybody feels bad when they see the, the commercial with a starving child or something like that. You know, and, and it truly is. It, it's 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 a travesty, but the one way that you can help to overcome starving children is to uh, let people get out there and actually make money and not be not have the government in the way. So I think the government gets in the way more often than it actually uh, gets out of the way. Well, so, whether they whether they for, you know honestly get in the way or they help more or whatever, it should be plain to every American, um, Democrat, Republican, Green Party, Libertarian, whatever you want to, 
whatever group you want to be associated with, it, it should be um, self-evident that our local leaders, our, our federal, national leaders, um, they're not very good with our money, with the taxpayer money. No, and that's the problem. I've always believed that it's my responsibility to help people on my own dime, you know, as opposed to using somebody else's dime to help other it's people. Hard to, it's but hard that's to the way the government feels. It's hard to do when you're having trouble just helping yourself, you know. Definitely. Definitely. Well, I just, uh, I wish you could make it uh, this uh Saturday, there there is a very interesting debate. Um, something that I don't often see here on a local level, um, and it's happening um, not here in Tucson, but in a steakhouse restaurant in Senoida, Arizona. That's you know where another. Senoida is? Have you ever been out to Sonoida? I know you, you've traveled through here. You probably never went to Sonoida. No, no, it doesn't sound familiar. I went to the major cities, Tucson, Flagstaff, and Phoenix. Okay, well, Sonoida is very, basically... There. And you guys have oh, a lot of really nice historical areas. Oh, yeah, your visit out to Arizona, were you in, impressed? Oh, yeah. I got to see Montezuma's everything, it seemed like the castle and the well, and got to see some old ruins out there. I guess it was called Casa Grande. Okay, Casa Grande. yeah. Yeah, just south yeah. of Phoenix there. This, just the scenery is absolutely beautiful. I I have to agree. Yeah, and I think it is nice. It's something I wanted to touch on um, before is, is as far as the places, the limited places I had lived that I explained, um, Tucson, it's people, uh, the neighbors, people you run across have been some of the nicest, uh, easy going. You can talk to strangers in most cases, uh, and very giving people. And for that, I'm proud. That that's something that you you know you people throw money at a problem, they think they're going to solve it. That's something that's t completely priceless. Well, typically giving giving somebody a number and giving handing them money does not solve the problem. It just creates um, creates a long term situation, as opposed right. to actually helping somebody out of the problem. Exactly. Helping somebody, you know, lifting somebody up. That's not that's not the job of the well it's not the job of the government. That's the job of the people that actually care about the people that you're trying to lift up. And you're, I haven't you're seen wrong. too much from the government. You're wrong. We voted in the New Deal and you just have to live with it. That's it. It's law. Get over it already. See, that that's my whole philosophy on uh, social programs is that I should help people myself. Because when when I help them myself, then they're more than just a number. They're a face, they're a person, you know, and that's how that's how the American people used to used to care about each other. Well, you used to help the individual. You didn't pass it off to the government, you know. People are but individual. Like we're 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 not supposed to be helped in the in a Fordian you know, utopia of manufacturing where everyone, boom, you know, is the exact same yeah, part. The problem is that to the government, I'm a nine-digit number. Right. That, that's that's what I am to the government. I'm not right. a person. I'm I'm a number. So. But the but the but you don't understand though, Aaron. The New Deal allows people to get help and still be assholes. If you had to help out someone on an individual level, would you help out a real jerk, someone who's mean to everybody and, you know, is a lazy bum and uh, is not motivated and just think that, uh, 
they're entitled to your money and for you to pay them away, you you wouldn't help them. So, I mean, how are we going to help the people who need the help the most, the people who uh, don't have the social skills to actually get help on an individual level? Well, at some level, people have to take responsibility for themselves, too. Yeah, well, I'll... You can help somebody out until the end of time, and if they don't have the responsibility for themselves, then they're never going to be an independent person. They're never going to make independent money, you know. And and, and uh, it's, it's... it's trying to teach people that there is there is a better way, you know. That that's that's what I've been all about in my lifetime. Well, trying to I'll show people again. that there's a better path. So I, I'll say it again: the New Deal is law. It's been law ever since Eisenhower, and you're just going to have to get over it. We need to help people. We need to really help people. We'll throw money at well, it. No, no, you, you know that isn't how I... I think some of the best... The, the solutions we need most is we don't need to be throwing money. We need solutions that are actually cost no money. But it, 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 there is a, a great sacrifice. Uh, and well, these are I'm, priceless solutions. They, they, you know, you, I'm not as... I don't think I'm quite as anti-government um, per se... But, you know, I think that that it should be minimized. The amount of money that the government spends on programs should be minimized as much as possible. You shouldn't have those, you know, loose things that just suck money out of the government. Because that's not the government's money. That's actually the people's money. Now you're talking anarchy. You're talking anarchy. No, I I no. I see right through your 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 propaganda and what I'm talking about is a return to responsible statesmanship. We need responsible statesmen again that actually care about the fact that this is not their money to just throw away. It's yeah. my money. It's your money. It's everybody else's money. Yeah, they I, put a little I, bit in the pot. They pay taxes too, but. Ultimately, it's the people's money. And if they don't get a good deal with the people's money, then what can you do, you know? Well, I, I, well, I, we I really fire do. Them. I do honestly agree with you that we do need statesmen that, that actually care. But if it doesn't happen with the people, if the people aren't responsible with, and they're promoting the statement, to spend the money on on everything and not we don't hold them responsible we're not taking that uh responsibility what we need well, is I, a department I think of that's what defense. yeah I think I think that's what we were discussing yesterday and you know earlier with our callers is the fact that you know people need to be responsible for for the votes that they cast because those votes are very important. You know, if you choose not to vote, if you uh, choose to avoid the vote, that is, uh, that is tantamount to basically voting for who you weren't going to vote for in the first place. Well, I, I understand that. I agree with that, you. That's I, how a democracy works, you know. I will uh, see yours, and I'll up you uh, one more and say that it... it, it Right right now, more than ever, I think in, in my lifetime, we need more than just someone who spent one day to vote. We need, we need people to actually go out there and devote their time and effort um, to, uh, to become, do a little bit To become bit involved more. in the process? I, I don't know. You know, it, I think it, it really comes down, I, there's, again, there's no 40 in factory way of saying, yeah, okay, if all you people do this one thing, um, you know, we'll get the positive results we're, we're all craving and looking for. I think it comes down to the individual. You have to see what you can do as an individual to make that positive impact in, in the world that we live in today and have a voice on how we're governed. And, um, uh, what we need is a, a, a moral majority to do what 
their indiv- individual talents uh, allow them to. I agree. I I believe wholeheartedly that everybody can contribute to our society in some level, and it actually, you know, improves um, their morale, I guess you could say, you know. Well, forget but that. That sounds like, you know, what I just said just sounds like way too much work. I'm not interested. I think I'll just pay a little more in taxes and we'll call well, it. Well, responsibility, day. yeah. Well, that's the easy way out. But ultimately, and, and, you know, to, to make the individual more responsible, again, for the governing of themselves, you know. And, and, and like you said earlier, it starts at the individual level and it moves up to the local level. And through every level of government, there should be accountability to the people for what we provide to the government, which is money, time, you know, the the love that we hold, the the patriotism that we hold for our country and our our local state and our local county and community, you know. So. Well, and I, I think I think doing the right thing instead of playing games. But you know, then again, if I throw money at it, I feel a lot better, and I don't have to do nearly as much work. I can, I can uh, blame other people well, that's, for the problems that's that whole I'm having. That's emotional around. propaganda that we were talking about yesterday. Emotional propaganda. You know, people that that throw words out there that make you feel better but don't actually get anything accomplished. A lot of people can yell at it, you know, they can yell at a problem and make it seem like somebody else's fault and then turn it all around and spend a lot of money and not get any results at all. And that is irrational. Well, it's more fun, too. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Appealing to your emotions, that is probably the most fun part of politics. But trying to be a rational person, trying to be a rational politician, that's actually quite hard. Well, sure, because a lot of people are using that adrenaline and their emotions and their their ill feelings towards bad situations and getting charged up and then attacking these logical people. Kind of uh, like what we've heard to our two guests, uh, Margaret and Kelly, it sounds like... Um, Paul Cunningham and Steve Kwachek, um is playing that emotional game. Oh, you guys are being sore losers. You know, we've been doing this, whatever. But it would be interesting and um, if we could actually get a, a chance to talk to Paul Cunningham and Steve Kwachek, uh with with as much respect as we would give any of our guests to kind that of would be very uh, interesting maybe get their logical, um, you know, perspective on what's going on here, uh, get the other side, so that way we can get both sides of the uh, scenario, because, uh, you know, on the one side that we hear, boy, you know, it sure sounds like, yeah, but I don't want to be a one-sided I, if we're gonna if we're gonna combat rational and non prop uh, non rational propaganda, we should have both sides. I, I would imagine. Yes, I agree with you. You can never get a rational decision that you make from only one side of an argument. Yeah, because with the information that I've gotten from the Republican side here, um, it sounds pretty black and white, and you know pretty cut and they're not being sore losers they uh they have legitimate concerns and um uh, it sounds like they're uh trying to do what's right by a a higher standard by our own constitutional morals um so I'll see what I can do maybe uh I'll get in contact with both these guys uh and see uh we can get them on and have the same kind of discussion. What do you think about that, Eric? That would be very interesting. I mean, okay. I, I really wish that we could just, you know, 
sit them both down to dinner and hash it all out without like all kinds of lobbying involved. But if that's the way it must be, then that's the way it must be. With all kinds of what? <laughs> involved you know, I, with all. I wish. I wish politics could be like you take somebody out to dinner and you solve all your problems. You know what I mean? But that's not the way politics works. Well, that's not relations. the way politics has ever worked. Well, that's but, not the way relationships work. You know? yeah, well, not always, you know. No, sometimes, sometimes you have some really good relationships, but in general, it, it just seems whether it's politics or whether it's loved ones or, or people you care about, family is a good example, um, where you just you don't see things eye to eye and, and there are some things that you don't see eye to eye to a point where it causes a rift and it causes problems. But your idea of actually sitting down and and discussing it, getting more information, getting a perspective from one side, getting a perspective from another in order to gain a greater understanding of somebody else's views or, or where they're coming from uh, can be very helpful. And I think that is a, a, a way to make a positive impact in the world we're living versus a bunch of name calling and uh, a bunch of silly board games. Like party politics. Yeah, well, Yay! <laughs> yeah, and dirty. Well, politics is a dirty game, for sure. Well, but the I, thing I is, think you know, it, that everybody has a right to believe what they want to believe, and everybody has a right to understand things in the way they want to understand them. But when it comes down to the system itself, it has to have some way to actually operate. And, you know, if, if people are gumming up the works, if they're, you know, causing issues that don't need to be caused, then that that's a big deal. Well, I, I agree. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can get those guests on. I will, uh, I will make the best effort I can uh, to see if we can get uh, City Council Member Paul Cunningham and uh, Steve Kowalczyk, uh to come and uh, be a guest on the show. Uh, of course, they're city councilmen, so I know they stay pretty busy. So I, if they can't make it, I guess we can't hate them too much. But uh, Let's see what I can do. I'll, I'll definitely uh, definitely touch on this again. Um, and I want to take a minute here. And uh, I had brought up Sonoida, Arizona. So the reason why I brought up Sonoida, Arizona, it's it's just a little small. I knew there was a reason. Yeah, there was a reason. <laughs> A pretty neat reason, because like I said, I, I don't really see this happen very often where uh, Republican candidates and uh, Democrats come together for an event and actually have a debate. Matter of fact, in my short couple of years' experience in uh, paying attention to local politics, I don't think I've ever seen that happen. But we have that happening here in this little town of Sonoida, which is basically a intersection, big set of lights, and a border patrol and a steakhouse and a couple other little little businesses. And uh, it's surrounded by a lot of land and, and cows. Um, what's going on? It'll be this Saturday. It's going to be Kelly Ward. Uh, she's running to unseat John McCain as U.S. Senator here for Arizona. Uh, she's going to be there with her Democratic counterpart, uh, Edna San Miguel, um, gunning for, I'm sorry, she's gunning for Rahal Garalva's seat as a U.S. Representative. Okay. And there's more. There's more. That's going to be this Saturday afternoon in Sonoida. Um, plus, we're going to have uh, Shelly Kazik. <clears throat> I think I pronounced that wrong. Um, it's spelled K-A-I-S. Who wants to become a member of the Republican Posse in uh, Legislative District 2. And her uh, Democratic counterpart there, Chris, Ackerley. 
hankering for a second term in the same legislative district or LD2. So for any... Sounds like um, you've got some interesting things going on there. Well, you know, like I said, I've, I've never seen this, this kind of uh, format where um, local representatives got together and debate uh, out in public. It's always been at the, uh, you know, local public news media on uh, TV. Uh, where well, isn't, they, isn't it in New England where they have the little town hall meetings and stuff like that? That would be a good model for, like, the whole United States. Yeah, yeah, in, in a lot of those eastern approach. states. Yeah. Yeah. They can well, just sit down and talk politics. There, you of course, know, they used yeah. to throw stuff, but now they don't tend to throw stuff anymore. <laughs> But, you know. I got some rotten just, fruit. That's the way it was. Bring my rotten fruit to Sonoida? No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. Do okay. I, I don't want to throw change. That can really hurt somebody, you know. Like, and besides, I need the money, even if it's a few cents. <laughs> Save so, it for your tax bill. Yeah, so I just, if anyone happens to be listening before um, this Saturday, November 21st, um, 2015, uh, invite uh, everyone to come out and uh, see uh, support your local candidate here in Sonoida. It's at the Stakeout Restaurant, and it's sponsored by Sonoida Elgin uh, Taxed Enough Already Party. So it is a Tea Party event. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> it's love great. It. It's hey, awesome. you know. I, I give kudos to Edna, uh, San Miguel, and, and Chris Ackerley uh, for coming out here and doing that. You know, that's uh, definitely a sign that uh, they're doing the right thing. They're not just just, just playing games. They're going to go out, have an honest debate. Hopefully no one throws anything. Um, yeah. I encourage everyone to give these wonderful guests, all four of them, uh, much respect. Um and so that's this Saturday, 1.30 to 4 p.m., and uh, I plan on being out there. So well, I'd love to and, see that. I mean, here in, uh, here in northwest Florida, we just, we just vote in Republicans all the time. <laughs> so, you know, don't really have very many debates. It's just Republican, which I'm a Republican. But, you know, I'd actually like to see some people that come out with a little bit different ideas. So, well, an honest, the, honest debate, that's, uh, that's something that you don't see very often, huh? No, no. But it's something I'd like to see. It is very, uh, it is very interesting to, to actually get perspectives, people's perspectives on why they understand the world the way they do, why they understand their politics the way they do, the, the psychology of it. You're not just satisfied with little sound bites? And five minute speeches you know, about comedy. I would like to actually life. understand. I would like to actually understand, you know, the people. Because that, that's when those people go out and they make those hard decisions, you need to know if they're, you know, are, are, are they going to stand? Are they going to fall? You know, it all depends on the strength of, of their personal beliefs and stuff like that. That's why I like to, when, when I vote for a politician, I vote for. Um, not only their um, their understanding of the political spectrum, but I, I also vote for their uh, their their commitment or what I feel is their commitment to whatever causes I feel are important to me. So very and much a like town hall see, meeting would be awesome. You'd like to see maybe where they're coming from, why they feel. Why are they making that stand? What's their logic behind it? Is that what you're kind right, of saying? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, you know, were were they just a college student and they learned this all in college, or did they actually learn this out in the field? You know, did they learn it fighting for our country? Did you know? And all this stuff, you know, kind of comes together. I'm I'm the son of a military veteran, so I tend to take veterans very highly. I take their opinions very highly. All my friends 
uh, Republicans or Democrats or veterans. I believe that uh, they have earned the right to say what they have to say. And I just naturally kind of extended that to everybody. So that's where, I'm yeah. at. That's where my personal idea of free speech comes from. Well, so free, free speech is important. and uh, You learned something thanks. about me today, my friend. <laughs> well, thanks to our veterans uh, uh, and their hard work and sacrifice that we have that free speech. Uh, it's, a, it's a rarity in this this world. Yes, every, every time we talk in the political spectrum, we have somebody out on the front lines to thank for it. It's very important. Yeah. It's very important to have a lot of respect and uh, for our veterans and caring for their uh, individual lives. Also, um, before I forget, before we run out of time here on the show, uh, I want to do a call out uh, thank you to Arizona Daily Independent, um, one of the more independent news sources here uh, in Arizona. Um uh, and I'm going to run their uh, promo here. So we'll do a quick promo for them. Um, they help make this show possible. You can Thank you. check them out at ArizonaDailyIndependent.com. The Arizona Daily Independent, the oldest member of the American Daily Independent News Network, is proud to present this portion of Red Pill Approved Radio. The Arizona Daily Independent, along with the other members of the ADINN, welcomes citizen journalists willing to contribute the truth no matter the cost. And Aaron, you brought up how you would like to be in Sonoida, Arizona, right, to see this debate. Is that correct? Oh, I'd love to. Well, I'll tell you what. I I can't get you here physically. I'm I'm not willing to pay for a plane ticket uh, to get you here uh, by Saturday. But here's how I'll get you the next best thing that I can do. I am going to uh, hopefully be there, as I stated. I'll bring my video camera and uh, see what uh, information I can uh, get together for you. And uh, I'll put out a video of the debate so I can share it with you and anybody else who would be interested uh, in seeing it. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, especially if people start throwing things. No. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, no. We want an honest debate. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I would yeah. To talk, but we're know. we're rational propaganda. Rational propaganda. Right, right. We we don't want the name calling and the throwing and the hard emotion. But you know, I'll get more hits on the video. Otherwise, it's yeah. just, you know boring. Oh, uh, just you know thoughtful debate. <sighs> Or, but you know me. I'm I'm not the uh, I'm not the Kardashian watcher. I actually want to see uh, something that actually you know has some some validity to it. So substance. Yeah, uh, I, I uh, agree. So, I, I actually want to see people debating ideas because that is I mean that ideas are what our republic is founded on, and and ultimately ideas are what we break down to when we become political. So I would like to well, see the ideas. Hopefully we see that this Saturday. I'm I'm kind of excited. Um, it'll be uh, Saturday in Sonoida at the Steakhouse Restaurant. If you're on Facebook, uh, there's an event for it uh, at the uh, the events called Sonoida Elgin Tea Party. Um, so we'll uh, and it says down in there, come meet the outlaws wanted to represent Kelly Ward. Uh, will be the keynote speaker, and then they have a cute little uh, wanted poster with all four uh, people who are running. So, uh, and we'll, uh, if I get out there and everything goes as planned, I'll get a a video made and have it um, put out on the Arizona Daily Independent. So I'll make sure that uh, you get uh, a link to that as well, Aaron. Um, that would be great. Super, super. Well, I, you know, I appreciate that I have uh, at least one viewer. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know that 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 just adds to the the three I already have. 
Um, I, even though I think one's a cocker spaniel, but uh, oh man, you know, you, hey, you can't discount any loyal viewers. Okay, right, definitely, definitely. And um, so I'll tell you what, I I plan to uh, get some um, some more audio clips uh, uploaded as long uh, as well as some some photos here. I had some technical difficulties today making that happen. But uh, as we quickly wrap up the show here, um, is there anything else that uh, you have on your mind or anything else I might have forgot to uh, talk about, bring up? Oh, I, I know. Yeah, I, was one, but, I was wondering but you about the Netflix, the Netflix situation. That's We're exactly do, uh, what Netflix I was thinking about. Netflix documentary time. Yeah, okay. I figured. Have you I figured watched what, any good Netflix documentaries lately? I I have, and and there's one that I have in mind. Um, I think I'm going to keep it a secret till next week, but I'll let you know uh, off air. And uh, if you think you could watch a 90 minute, maybe you know at most two hour documentary on Netflix. Um, we can write a couple of notes and our own personal thoughts on that. And then uh, one of the features we can do uh, on the show is uh, we can compare notes and kind of, you know, give our personal opinion on that. Oh, you mean you really want my personal understanding of a specific yeah. documentary on the air? Yeah, yeah I got to... Yeah. I, look, I got to pick on somebody. <laughs> you know, I got to... Yeah. <laughs> I well, think that's stupid, Aaron. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, it, uh, you know, in all honesty, I think that, um, you know, hey, I get your opinion, you, I got my opinion, and and uh, maybe different thoughts, and it might uh, spontane. Well, it uh, goes, yeah, it goes back to that whole thing, you know, the 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 free allotment of ideas. That, that makes our country so great in the first place. The, the, the free exchange, the ability to, to throw ideas around and, and come out with, uh, you know, a rational, rational idea that actually works on a greater level. So, and perhaps, yeah. perhaps this, uh, this video that you want to watch will actually have one of those ideas. Well, I, I we will hope see. so. There, I'll tell you what, I'll, I, I have about, three different documentaries in mind and uh, I'll let you pick out of the three I'll send you the previews or something like that on on which one that uh, might be most um, you're most interested in and then we'll take it from there and and okay. also I encourage you or or uh, maybe one of our three uh, viewers to uh, you know give us ideas on that Depending on how the show goes, I uh, I also plan on um, starting a uh, Facebook fan page, so that way we can give our our uh, three viewers, or maybe our two, because I don't know if the the cocker spaniels online, uh, just a place <laughs> where they can, where we can get some feedback here. So well, uh, I would I, I've got a bunch of people that I think would be interested. Um, Every everything from uh, deep left socialists all the way over to hard right Republican, I, I attract an interesting crowd. So. Well, I, you know, I I think uh, I think I'm kind of in the same ballpark because, quite frankly, I I I'm sick of the games. I I'm, I don't like games in politics. I don't like games in real life. Um, I uh, I will talk to anybody, and if you're a decent person, you give me respect, or or you have uh, opposing ideas, I, I'm not going to hate you for them. Uh, but I'm under this belief that uh, I don't know everything, and I would like to know what the heck is going on around here. So uh, I <laughs> yeah, can't I find that. I I can't find that out if. Uh, if uh, everyone's just patting me on the back and telling me, "Yeah, okay, I agree," and you know, yeah, I um, 
Well, I, I think I think once again that it's interesting to hear other people's ideas on things. Absolutely. Because you're right. So nobody I, nobody's right about everything. Well, I I don't know. I don't know. I I'm limited because uh, I'm in this human body and and uh, I'm dealing with technology that's so far advanced uh, above. Uh, Above what uh, the way my brain works, so I can only do so much. Um, but it's nice to have the technology to make me sound smarter, <laughs> <laughs> make me sound like a know-it-all. But uh, in in I I don't claim to know it all, and uh, quite frankly, I'll, I'll go out on a stretch, and I don't think anyone knows it all. Well. Yeah, but I do I want your you. opinion. I do want your opinion. I I think this weekly Netflix documentary review is a good thing. Um, and see, I I think it would be a great thing to actually, like you were talking earlier about having uh, guests on the show that may not exactly 100% mesh with our political affiliations, but nonetheless have their own opinions and can express those opinions in a free and open forum. Well, yeah, and and that's one of the. Um, I I hope never to get away from our core issues, uh, our our core values of why we're, why both you and I are collaborating in this radio program, and it is to, to build a a safe environment, uh, a place where people can actually have an honest debate, a respectful uh, debate, because, it appears that um, the politics that I grew up knowing, the the type of politics uh, that we hear from our mass media that's uh, there, the established mass media, uh, doesn't provide that safe place. It, it more or less uh, relies on the uh, emotions. And uh, when you get heavy emotions, uh, I think that opens the door to uh, non-rational propaganda, so to speak. But in my mind, it's all propaganda. Yeah, it it opens the door to non-rational decision-making, too. Well, just just like everything else, you know, whether it's it's politics or it's having a heated argument with uh, a loved one or or someone you care about, um, if you fly off the handle and you throw a little temper tantrum... uh, you're liable to hurt somebody else or hurt yourself or, or just screw things up. And uh, I would encourage anyone, um, whether I agree with you politically or not, not to do that. <laughs> well, yeah, especially if you're married. Well, the the whole point in that is, is to hopefully, um, you know, have a more positive uh tomorrow and um, I want people to stay optimistic now I can prefer my my I, I'm I don't want to be boxed into any political category um, I'm an individual I I take part in a political process or a political party um, I'm taking part in that group uh, I'm taking a part in it as an individual with my own ideas my own philosophies uh, and I encourage everyone to do that. In saying that, you also have to look at the other side of the coin. And don't be a bigot. Don't group a whole bunch of people into a category in a box and label them and say, these thousands of individuals all fit this one category like we were made on an assembly line. It's just not the case. I, I have... I think it's kind of human nature, though. We, I mean, we, through evolution, we, or, you know, if you, if you believe in the evolutionary idea, then, um, you know, we, we, we kind of, our brains are trained to make connections between things. So, well, we're you filling know. in the, the way I see it, it's human nature that we fill in the blanks. We meet someone uh, that we're maybe interested in a romantic relationship. And we know very little about that person, but nature tells us that our mind tells us it fills in the blanks and makes everything look 
rosy and peachy until a couple of months down the road when you start filling in the blanks with with reality. And well, see, I think, my truth... I think in the, okay, go ahead. Sorry, man. Oh, I, I was just going to say my truth when it comes to political ideologies and, and, and uh, talking to people, because I get along with, you know, anybody who who wants to talk politics with me, whether you're uh, a communist or you're not, or you're a, a freedom guy. I, myself, I know this for a fact, I prefer freedom. I prefer for my own freedom. I prefer freedom for everybody. But no two people have I ever met and talked anything of any substance with that uh, and got past the, uh, the skin deep that I've ever met that is exactly the same in, in thought or being. Nope. We, were, or we weren't built on assembly lines. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that it doesn't seem like there's anybody that, that like, you know, th- there, are, there are party followers, and then there are people who um, think about things and come to their own conclusions. And like, you know, I... I I definitely affiliate more with one party than the other, but I have some ideas from both parties that I agree with. And and I don't think they're being well served right now, you know, by, you know, um, the the guests that we had on earlier talking about, you know, the ability for people to make money. That's definitely a very important part of my uh, political ethos, but, uh, you know, there are other things that I don't agree necessarily with the right on. For example, the environmental situation. I, I well, tend to be more of a I tend to be more of a business, but careful. You know, careful business. Be be consider the environment kind of. Well, the, the environment but, the environment should should be a concern of everyone. We have to live in it. Yes. You know. I agree. Now. How to deal with it, I think that's that's the real argument. Do we want to send money right, to centralized right. planners or do we wanna do do we wanna do a combination of both where we we uh help fix our environment? But I think whether regardless of uh what political party your your environment and our world uh, being a steward of the people, being a steward of the world that's all very important, you know. I but again, it it, it seems to get summed up in uh, and people get confused because they're too busy playing the politics of it all, party politics. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I think it's about time we wrap up the show. How about one more, one more play at everyone's favorite song? Uh, I like this song. Won't we won't hear it again till uh, tax season, unless we. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna dance for this one, uh, but uh, Aaron, thank you very much for the co-host. Um, thank you, Jay. And, and uh, thanks for making a positive impact on the show. Rational propaganda media, uh, in part with uh, Arizona Daily Independent. Um, trying to do the best we can to get the truth out there, whatever that truth may be. Uh, hopefully we uncover it in a non-biased manner. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Have a great night. And here we go. I said to my uncle Sam, in Texas, here I am and he.
Media. Radio. Red Pill Approved Radio is sponsored by the American Daily Independent News Network. The ADINN is committed to bringing you the Red Pill Truth, be it local or national, focused on educational and political news. News is accumulated from the daily independent local media publications from around the country.